Hey everybody, my name is Adam Neely. I'm here answering all of your questions about bass and music in general. So let's get started. X Desio X writes, Are you reading sheet music or tablature during this performance? Yes, so in my previous video where I was playing a bunch of video game covers at the Bit Awards, I was definitely reading sheet music. You can definitely see it in my eyes as I'm staring at my iPad holding on for dear life because there was a lot of music we had to learn, and some of it was quite difficult. Now don't get me wrong, I was not sight reading the music. I was not looking at the music for the first time at the gig. That would be fairly irresponsible of me because Zach Zinger, the band leader, had sent the music several days beforehand. That's considered common practice, by the way, for these sorts of reading gigs. Receiving the music a couple of days beforehand, running over any problem spots that you might have, and making sure that you really know how to play them before you show up to rehearsal. That said, this particular gig, the one where I'm playing these fun video game covers at an awards show, was very much a reading gig. It was one of those fairly rare instances where I, as a non-classical musician, needed to know how to read music in order to actually make the music happen. These instances, for me, honestly, are far and few between, which is something that, honestly, maybe my music school education didn't quite get right when it told me how important sight reading was. At least for working professionals, never mind original artists who, if they don't feel like it, don't need to learn how to read sheet music at all. I talked with my good friend Elliot Klein a little bit about this when we were hanging out after Nam over dinner. What were we just talking about? We are talking about the importance of sight reading. Right. That should be a thing they pass out at Berkeley or something like that. The importance of sight reading asterisk. Like, it might be important. <laughs> or it might not. That would be the most honest thing you could say. Learn sight reading because you never know. <laughs> I mean like, okay, what are these you never know sections? If you play jazz, musical theater. Also classical, but you wouldn't be going to Berkeley for that reason. That's true. It's the only thing that gets brought up, being like, man, back in the day, if you couldn't read this, and you were, it's, it's always like some dated example. If you were with Tribal Tech or recording the first Star Wars. I mean, well, the problem is, is like, even though it's a you never know sort of situation, it requires so much time and energy to like so actually do it. And, and that's the thing, it's quite a lot of work to be able to read at a professional level. On an intellectual level, it's actually not that hard. All you need to know is which lines and spaces go with which notes on your instrument, but you want to be able to do that beyond the intellectual level. You want to be able to read music fluently and musically. You want to take the idea that's on the page and realize it on your instrument in a way that makes sense. An analogy for somebody first learning how to read sheet music and exhaustively picking out the notes one by one without knowing how they come together into a musical phrase would be like if I attempted to read a phrase in Norwegian. And I apologize for all my Norwegian viewers. <clears throat> I are Mota 13 Sprechinger op og en av dem var Joran Lund fra Lanka. The fact of the matter is, though, not that many gigs require you to speak Norwegian or read sheet music for that matter. Now this hasn't always been the case, because it used to be that sheet music was the only way of communicating ideas from one musician to another. You couldn't just Dropbox a folder of demos or Guitar Pro tabs or whatever to your musicians in the 1960s. No, you had to write out sheet music for everybody. And sometimes the only way to get it to them would just be to drop it on their stand the night of the gig or the recording session. It used to be like a matter of time. There just wasn't enough time to like get everything together and you know, you It was probably internet. written out by hand by someone and it looked very gorgeous yeah, and Yeah, and it's also you can't, you couldn't like fax, like. <laughs> <laughs> no one faxed Frank Sinatra. Like, we're gonna cover this set list. <laughs> yeah, like, Nelson Riddle wasn't like faxing all of his musicians, like all of the music before the Frank Sinatra session. Um, no one got airdropped anything. I don't know how the fuck that is. Like. <laughs> There were no iPads on those sessions, <laughs> unfortunately. Anyway, to sum up, reading sheet music can be an enormously useful, albeit sometimes niche, skill that could potentially help get you gigs like reading a bunch of video game cover music at the Bit Awards. So, take that with what you will. James Frank writes, Hi Adam, question for a future q and I'm a guitarist and I'm trying to improve my sight reading, so what will you suggest to me as a guitarist? How to study and if you know how score are right for a guitarist if chords are also included in the sheet. More reading questions. Okay, so I think the best place to start if you're a guitar player or any instrumentalist, if you have some degree of facility on your instrument, is any piece of music that Bach ever wrote. In the beginning, especially if you already know how to play your instrument, it's going to be very frustrating for you. It's going to be the equivalent of me attempting very poorly to read Norwegian. However, there's something in the music of Bach that makes it so that no matter how slow you play it, it's just so damn enjoyable to play. Even if you're just picking out the notes like 
once every minute. There's something so musical about it that it just makes you want to keep practicing and keep reading. Staying motivated when you're slogging through sheet music, when you're learning how to read, can be a real problem sometimes, but I've never found that with Bach. A good place to start maybe would be his flute partitas. You can download them for free at imslp.org. It's a free repository of public domain sheet music. But honestly, just picking up any piece of sheet music that Bach wrote and just kind of going at it will do the trick. Just start reading the notes in order. Okay, we got a we got a D there, okay? And we got we got a C sharp, and then we got a, a D, and then we have an A. Congratulations, you're reading Bach, and it's a lot of fun. But unfortunately, there is one thing that the music of Bach won't help you out all that much with as a contemporary guitarist, and that is rhythm. The kinds of syncopated rhythms that exist today didn't really exist in the music of Bach, so there is actually a book that's good for practicing the basic rudiments of this, and that book is called Syncopation. It's written for drummers, but honestly, any musician will get a lot out of the book by taking the rhythms that are in the book and playing them on whatever note you feel like. Blind Man with Echolocation writes, An interesting video would be on the concept of Musica Universalis. I think it's complete bullshit, and it's not technically music theory, but it's quite a strange area. Okay, so Musica Universalis is also known as Harmony of the Spheres. It's a concept which goes back to the ancient Greeks, which basically says there are two kinds of music. The first kind is the vulgar kind, the kind that we hear, the kind that we play here on this earth that tugs at our emotions and causes us to feel things. This is not the true music, however. The true, more divine music is what happens up above, with the celestial bodies orbiting the earth, in the case of the Greeks, but orbiting the sun now. And anyway, there's an interesting logic to this. The kind of music that we make for ourselves is, on a fundamental level, one based on frequency. If, say, we play one note, and it vibrates the air at 200 times per second, and another note, which vibrates the air at 300 times per second, they sound good with one another because there is a simple mathematical relationship between the two frequencies, one of three to two. The Greek mathematician Pythagoras is the one who initially made this observation, that simple ratios between two sounds will sound good. The story goes is that he initially came to this observation by walking past two blacksmiths, pounding away at their anvils. He noticed that the sounds that the anvils made were quite pleasant to the ear, and so he measured the anvils and found that they formed a three to two relationship in terms of their total size. He created a system of tuning, known today as Pythagorean tuning, based on the idea that the simple relationship created some something beautiful and meaningful to humans as music. This idea of proportions being the source of appreciable beauty was applied to everything. The idea that the heavens were beautiful because they could be measured and therefore were some kind of grander music than we could perceive actually was a very popular one throughout most of Western thought. Johannes Kepler, in his 1619 book Harmonices Mundi, expanded on this concept quite a bit, relating new observations in astronomy, like, for example, the fact that the Earth revolves around the Sun, to specific melodies and harmonies based on the idea that ratios equals beauty, even if we can't immediately perceive it because it's not being expressed as a sound wave. A more modern modern understanding of harmony of the spheres comes through the study of something called orbital resonance, which I talked a little bit about in my talk at Ableton Loop back in 2017. If you take like a moon as it's orbiting a, like a planet, and it takes maybe every four months to rotate around a given planet, and then you have another moon that rotates every two months, they form a four to two relationship or a two to one relationship. And the point at which they're both in the same place is the, called the point of orbital resonance, and that point keeps those bodies in the same sort of orbit. A bunch of Wikipedia uh, entries of known populations of resonance. We got a 2-3 resonances, we got a bunch of those. We got 3-5 resonances, which are at the major sixth. We have 4-7 resonances, which is at an interval called the harmonic seventh. This all comes down to the fact that we humans can only perceive certain things as music. Only certain things are going to be meaningful to us as music. The orbits of Mars and Jupiter aren't going to be musical to us because we we can't hear them. But that doesn't mean that we can't potentially think about it musically, which is kind of exciting. Really, the only difference between what's happening up there and down here is that music is physical resonance in air, and up there, it's physical resonance in terms of orbits. Ian Leggett writes, Question for your next Q&A. How do you feel about the Berkeley online programs? I'm from Canada, and it's impossible for me to actually go to these colleges physically. Okay, so I don't know a whole lot about the Berkeley online program. I know that you can get your bachelor's degree and your master's degree from it, but I will say this. It's really expensive. Less expensive, yes, than going to Berkeley in person. But the main thing that I got from going to the Berkeley College of Music was not the information, which is what you get when you go and take an online course. I've said this many times before, but the main value of going to music school is not the information, it's the people. You can learn 
music theory and ear training and composition anywhere. But being with people who are as hungry as you are to learn will help challenge you to be the best musician that you can be. So with that said, for you, if you can't attend Berkeley in Boston, maybe study at McGill. Really any physical location where you have musicians studying along with one another is what you want. Music is a communal activity. And to get that sort of work ethic and to get that sort of thing while you're studying is, is really the essence of what I think music school is all about. Tobias Fick writes, what's that electric flute thing he's playing? So Zach Zinger in the previous video was playing an electronic wind instrument, otherwise known as an iwi. Basically a synthesizer that you play like a woodwind instrument. And they're moderately popular in the 1980s, kind of like keytars were. Now I personally think they are a lot more expressive and a lot more interesting than keytars, but they kind of fell by the wayside after the 1980s ended. Recently though, some woodwind players have been dabbling in iwi and it's a really cool texture, I think. Carlos from Insane in the Rain Music recently did a video exploring some of the nuances of playing an iwi from the perspective of a woodwind player. You should definitely check that out. It's great fun and I hope to do my part in showcasing Iwi playing because I think the Iwi is a fantastic instrument and more people should play it. Justin Davis writes, As always, these are so well put together. Those countins look mad confusing though. Wags finger ambiguously for a seemingly random amount of time and two, everyone plays. Yeah, welcome to the down and dirty world of on the bandstand conducting where you really just have literally a beat to start playing. So if we look at the video, you can see what Zach is doing to bring us all in at the right moment. He's literally breathing in on the pickup beat right before we enter. The breath is our cue and then he drops his instrument down on what conductors would call the ictus the point of gravity which denotes the downbeat. This sort of thing needs to happen quickly because we are trying to time the music starting with exactly the end of the speaker talking. Uh -oh. These are the sorts of things that you just kind of learn by doing it a lot and it's really kind of like the down and dirty version of conducting. It's not the conducting with the baton but it's the same general idea, getting the whole band on the same page very quickly. Caleb Scola writes, Hey Adam, what do you think of music critics? Do you think that it's unfair to criticize without being able to create? Or is it a necessary part of the industry? So I'm gonna answer your first question the way that I guess it's typically answered. I don't need to be a chef to know what food I like. I might cook a little bit for myself, but I don't need to cook the food that I'm eating to know whether or not it is that I like it or I dislike it. And it's the same thing with music. However, if you're going to be a food critic, you better know your food. You better know the techniques and styles. You better know the flavors very well. You might not necessarily need to have the technique and experience of chefs, but you should at least have the same sort of general knowledge set of chefs, I think, in order for your opinion as a food critic to have any sort of weight. The same thing with music. Apparently there are some lyrics to a song called Bodak Yellow, which I've never heard of these things, so that's why I analyze them for you, because if I haven't heard of them, I assume that you haven't either. Maybe I'm just uninformed. If you're gonna be critiquing a piece of music or food in a certain style, you better have a good understanding of how it was put together, why it was put together, and its relationship to other examples in that style. Otherwise, your opinion on whether or not you like it is just not very useful to other people. That said, there's more to musical criticism than just having opinions. It's also the ability to articulate them, whether or not it's in writing or say somebody like Anthony Fantano through video reviews. Stefan Backenstows writes, How long have you been shooting Sony? The last time I remember seeing your camera, it was a T6i, T3i maybe. Do you struggle with mic levels? It always seemed like even the lowest gain didn't have enough headroom for a recorded performance. Big reason why I switched. Okay, yeah, so for the longest time, I shot all of my YouTube videos on this bad boy, the Canon Rebel T6i, which is a fantastic beginning DSLR for people like me who don't really know a whole lot about cameras. I have the Sigma wide-angle lens on it, and it works really great for me. But I've since switched to this Lumix GH5, and I'm recording audio from this bad boy, the Audio-Technica 8035 shotgun mic, and I'm recording audio over there in Ableton Live. One of the reasons why I have this sort of setup instead of the typical vlogger setup where you have you know, a shotgun mic attached to the camera is because the EOS Rebel T6i has a garbage preamp inside of it. It distorts and sounds terrible in live situations. Honestly, one of the things that I found the most when I've been making these YouTube videos is that Audio quality matters probably more than anything else. You could have really excellent video with garbage audio and it ends up sort of feeling unprofessional versus having really garbage video but good audio and it ends up 
I don't know, sounding and feeling a lot more like a professional operation. What this has always told me is that sound is a much more tangible means of expression than light. Sound is the thing that literally, physically, touches you, and is much more apt to make you feel something. So, philosophically, I think, for producing videos, having the highest quality audio is the most important.